Hi everybody, I'm Melinda Bikini and I'm a volunteer with the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. Um, I'm also a five year survivor of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and I'm also the one and only patient they talked about on Dr. Rosenberg's trial that's had success with immunotherapy. I'm 46 years old, I was 41 years old when I was diagnosed, um, a mother of six, um, from 26 years old to 12 years old and the big black lab's 140 pounds and he's my best friend. <laughs> I just want you guys to see my family and um, I thank you for letting me give the patient perspective of the cholangiocarcinoma journey. And I also thank you so much for being here because I'm so glad to see you collaborating to be able to make a difference for future patients. Um, I wanted to tell my story from the beginning because even though I have a unique ending, I have a very familiar story to so many people. Um, at first, I didn't have a lot of symptoms. Um, I worked as a paramedic for about 20 years and um, looking back I can think of being extremely tired, but I worked 24 hour shifts so it made sense that I was tired and I was getting older. I also um, had right shoulder pain, but I carried a pack and a monitor on my right shoulder so I thought that's why I had right shoulder pain. And I got a lot of irritable bowels too, but once again I worked 24 hour shifts and ate pretty crappy some days so it, you know, all of that kind of made sense for my job. But we went away for two weeks to a critical care nursing course and we were eating out every day. And that's when something really seemed wrong to me. Um, I started getting the indigestion, the heartburn, tightness around my chest. And I just knew something was wrong, but I thought it was gallbladders or gallstones because my mom had them, my sister had them. I was female, 40, fertile, fat, you know, all that, so I thought for sure it was um, gallstones. Um, when we got home, the symptoms kind of dissipated and kind of forgot about it for a little bit. And then um, I went to my primary doctor in November of 2009 for something totally different and I mentioned it to him and thank goodness he wanted to get an ultrasound and the next day they found a mass on my liver. And so then he called me back for a CT that confirmed the mass on my liver. Um, I knew I was going to talk faster than my slides. He or sent me to a gastroenterologist and um, she told me not to panic. She said, don't worry, you know, it's um, probably a hemangioma and, you know, don't worry, it's a benign tumor and, you know, nothing to worry about. Um, she then said we should do a tagged red blood cell study that would prove or disprove the hemangioma. Um, we did the tagged red blood cell study and it proved it wasn't a hemangioma. So they sent me for a liver biopsy and they sent me on Wednesday before Thanksgiving and so I knew I was going to have to wait that whole entire weekend before I got my results and that was, that was horrible. So don't do that to your patients. <laughs> That's a long wait. Um, December 1st, it was a Tuesday morning. It was my son's 14th birthday and um, the kids had just gone off to school my husband had just left and I was just about to jump in the shower and I got that phone call from my GI doc and you know she she said I'm so sorry you have cancer and she apologized she's like I'm so sorry it wasn't on my radar and I said I'm so sorry too it wasn't on my radar either and, and then I kind of forgot everything she said after that and, you know, everything just kind of went blank so I immediately called my husband he came home and we cried and you know it was it was devastating and um, he then had to call the GI doc back and <laughs> hear everything that she told me that I couldn't remember. And I'm from Billings, Montana, so I'm in a you know very rural area with not a lot of facilities. But thank goodness we do have the best facilities in the area and everything moved really fast. So there wasn't a lot of waiting after that. Um, the day after I got my phone call, I um, she sent me to an oncologist right away and um, the biopsy didn't show for sure that it was cholangiocarcinoma at that time and so they wanted to search for the primary, primary tumor. So once again, I was backed for more tests. Did the mammogram, not breast cancer. Did the head to toe CT, no other masses were found. Endoscopy was clear, colonoscopy was clear. MRI just confirmed that the mass was in my liver and the PET scan only showed um, reactive cells in my liver as well. So that is when they told me that it most likely was cholangiocarcinoma and like most patients, they've never heard that word before. 
And like most patients, I went home and Googled it, which is not a good idea either. <laughs> These are the facts that I found, and this is what stuck with me. Um, it was rare, late stages. I knew it was intrahepatic. Surgery was the only cure. No proven chemo, chemo regimen. And the reoccurrence rate was 76%. And you know, to me, those were horrible statistics. And, and I didn't really want to have anything to do with that. Um, so right away, we made plans for having the resection. Um, met with the surgeon right away. And they gave me the choice that I could go to Mayo Clinic to have my surgery done or stay home. We met with the surgeon, and um, he won my confidence. I felt confident that he could do them, even though I, he told us, you know, he probably had only done four or five in his, in his years of service. He still won my confidence, and like most mothers, I did not want to leave my children and have to stress about that. So we stayed home and had the surgery done. Six hours, five units of blood, two-thirds of my liver removed, and that's what they found. Um, supposedly, they had good margins. I think it was like a nine centimeter by 15 centimeter tumor. Um, supposedly everything was good. Um, thought we got it all. Uh, left a nice scar. My kids call it my shark bite. Um, my three month checkup of March 2010 went back and spots showed up at my lungs. I grew up in Libby, Montana, which happens to be one of the biggest asbestos dump sites in the United States. So they did a biopsy because they were thinking, it, you know, possibly could be the mesothelioma, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, they didn't get good results on the biopsy, so I went ahead and um, had a lung wedge that confirmed the metastasis. And then I was given that label stage four terminal cancer, which makes me laugh because technically I'm still stage four terminal cancer. So. I bought my first chest tube for the first time in my life. Um, I immediately knew at that point that I needed to look for clinical trials because the research that I did, the data out there said that there was no, you know, no cure for what was out there, what was going to work, wasn't going to work forever. Well, I had six kids and that wasn't a good enough answer for me. So I had a really aggressive oncologist and he searched and searched and found some clinical trials. But my insurance denied the coverage, and immediately I was just defeated and heartbroken. And that's another battle that patients have to go through that's really super hard. Um, at the time, there was no way I was going to leave my family in financial distress, so I kind of aborted the idea of clinical trials and went ahead with what the insurance would cover. We even took a trip out to Mayo, got a second opinion. Um, there was no clinical trials going on at that time, and they recommended the same treatment of Gemsys to go ahead and get started on. I left my daughter, my oldest daughter graduated high school, did all our congratulations, had a quick party, and I took off. We headed on the road to the Mayo Clinic, and, and I, I show you these things just to show you how it just affects you know, the whole family and in, in the way this journey goes. My first name of chemo picture, You'll see soon how my smile changes. I had no idea what I was getting into. I was excited, the first one. Soon found out chemo sucks. Um, I did the Gemsys for six months. Um, the steroids, the antiemetics, the Benadryl, the Nupagen shots, to me, were one of the most painful things I've ever had. I never knew your bones could ache so much. I did this for about six months and the toxicity set in. To this day, my biggest complaint is still the neuropathy in my feet and my legs and my hands. I still have the tinnitus in my ears, and that's all livable, and I can, I can handle that, um, but that to this day is still my biggest complaint. Um, doing the gem cysts with the steroids, I started to get some steroid psychosis. I didn't know it at the time. I thought I was going crazy. Um, there were days where I thought I could just drive off a cliff and, you know, it just wouldn't bother me. So I knew something was wrong and as soon as I went off the steroids, it helped tremendously. But it also then made the effects of the chemo worse. So there was a give and take to that. Um, the picture is before chemo and this was the end of my first six months of chemo and just showing the drastic effect that it does take on a, you know, on a person and how fast the changes are. And went wig hunting. 
I hated wearing a wig. I was so much more self-conscious having a wig because I was always afraid it was going to fall off than I was just being bald. I took a chemo holiday after the gem cysts and um, enjoyed the holidays for a while. At that point, um, my oncologist moved back east and I had to have a new one. And um, they put me on gems are alone to try to I guess, reduce the toxicity, and at that point, my cancer grew in my lungs and spread back to my liver. So when I got that news, I decided to go to Hawaii. <laughs> Come back from Hawaii with a new treatment plan, um, and during that time frame, I met up with a group of people who were testifying, because in Montana, there was not a law that states that your insurance has to cover clinical trial standard of care. So a group of us went up and told our stories several times to all the different committees, and we did get a law passed. Um, Governor Bullock signed that law off, and I'm very proud of the work we did, but at the same time, it's still so frustrating because there's so many loopholes and red, red tape that still has to be addressed every time a person you know, attempts to be on a clinical trial. So there's a lot of other things that go along with, with you know, wanting to do something to make a difference in the treatment. I then got put on Taxotere, um, and this was probably like the summer of maybe 2011. And my cancer stayed stable for a while, and I did that again for about six months, and then um, the toxicity built up again. I, personally, I just don't like chemo, I think, and I'm not sure I know anybody who does. But the last straw for me was I ended up with a head-to-toe rash, and I totally just wanted to scratch my skin off. Um, so about that time, oops, sorry, I, it came to the decision of wanting better quality of life versus the quantity, and talking it over with my family, you know, I just I decided I didn't want to do chemo anymore, and especially with a drug that wasn't going to cure me. So I'd made up my mind, you know, that I was done with that. There weren't a lot of other options. And then I found the clinical trial at the National Institute of Health. And when I read it, I saw that it had the initial chemo to deplete your immune system. But then after that, it was your body doing the work. And, and it just sounded amazing to me. So I looked at my husband. I said, this is what I want to do. And um, we made the calls. And I took it to my oncologist. and. You know, he said he would support me with whatever I wanted to do, but he, they worked out with a group out of um, Denver for most of their clinical trials. And he was very supportive. And I know since that time he has sent six different patients for other things out there. So I think it was a good thing for them as well. I entered the trial in March of 2012. Um, they resected four tumors out of my left lung. And from that, they pulled the, the T cells, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and harvested them, grew them for about a month, and then we returned in April. The f and it's a month stay. It's, it's not an easy treatment by any means. I've done it twice, and I would do it again in a heartbeat to get the results that I've received. But the first week there, um, you receive the immunodepleting depleting chemo, and, and that's just yucky. You know, it wipes you out, completely bald, nausea, diarrhea, all that good stuff. And then the second week, um, they give you your cells back. The first time I got 42.6 billion um, with the IL-2, and the IL-2 um, they described to me was kind of like food to keep the cells stimulated. But I only made it to four doses of that before instantly, you know, you gain 20 pounds of water weight, and my lungs started filling up with the water. Um, and then after that, the third and fourth week is recovering your cells enough to be able to go home. And that was the hardest part for me. It took a while for my platelets to bounce back. I ended up, I think, with about 11 transfusions, and my body reject rejected a lot of that, the, the antibody with the platelets, something like that. And that part was the hardest for me. But once my body started kicking in and, and making them, um, it, every day got better. And when I got home, before I entered the trial, um, I had a chronic cough, I had tumors all over my lungs, and then um, when I got home, it was within a couple weeks, that cough went away, my energy came back, and I was doing amazing. And in that first 18 months of the first treatment, they were able to sequence my tumor and discovered the one T cell that recognized one of my mutations, so they wanted to retreat me. So I went back 
to NIH for more testing in September of 2013. They um, harvested three tumors from my right lung that time, pulled off the cells, but they specifically this time grew that one T cell. So the same repeated treatment again, and then this time they put in 127 billion, so three times as many with 95 percent of it being that specific population. I think entering it the second time I was in better shape, but the second time I think it hit me a little bit harder. Um, I remember having problems with my creatinine being too high, and then I just think that huge immune response with three times as many cells hit me harder too. But once again, as soon as I got home, um, it was just every day was an improvement. And so now I'm 16 months out. I go back again the end of this month. And the last time I went back was October, and that was a year out. And things were still, still shrinking, still going downhill. It slowed down, but they said they expect that to happen. And, and I don't care if it changes from where I'm at now, because from where I'm at now, it, I can live this way forever, and I'm happy with it. But I'm really happy that you guys are here because I'm hoping that between the collaboration of everybody and, and maybe more trials that we'll be able to help more people. I get calls from all sorts of people. I know a lot of your patients call me and, and you know, they just want hope. They want to know that there is a beacon of hope out there, that there could possibly be a chance for them to be as fortunate as I am. I don't know why I'm so successful. I'm great. So I know, you know, that there's, there's got to be others and that there's got to be a way for us to figure it out. And I know that Dr. Rosenberg and his team, they are working diligently and around the clock and they're, you know, they're making a difference. But so far there hasn't been any successes like myself. There's been a few non-official partial responses, but none that have lasted like this. So I'm just hope and pray every day that they keep working and figure it out. Um, I talked way faster than my slides. That was it. That was my, my story. But it was really important for me to show you guys the patient perspective of how this all comes about. And that's Dr. Eric Tran, the research scientist who um, was able to identify this one T cell and, and retreat me the second time with that specific T cell. And he was very generous and nice, and he gave us a tour of the lab and explained to us in layman's terms as best as he could, you know, the process. And we learned so much from him. And he's been a great help to me ever since. A year ago at Christmas, I was bald. A month, this is us a month after treatment skiing. And that's, that's how good I felt after that. That's how fast it worked. These are tumors in my lungs. Um, I think second treatment versus um, six months down the road. I think that's the same slide that you saw earlier. Um, and that's where I was. This is the last, um, the last, I guess, measurements in October of where I'm at, where the decrease in tumors are. Those are also lung tumors, and then the decrease after six months of the TIL therapy. And there's, this is the only one of the liver that I could find. Um, I had a PET scan done in June, and the tumors in the liver um, did not light up at all, so they're hoping that they're just necrotic and there's nothing growing there, and, and that's it. And the data was published in the science article, and um, I had it autographed. It's hanging in my bedroom right next to my board that says every day holds a possibility of a miracle, and I believe it with all my heart. Thank you for letting me tell my story. Thank you, Melinda, for, for sharing your experience.